really blessed to be here. Joe has been a great uh, champion to have this take place, to be here with the great Archbishop Vigano, without whom McCarrick would still be in power because he's Bergoglio's bosom buddy. Be here with Doug Berry, who I'll refer to in just a moment. To be here with all of you. Especially all these kids. I'm old enough I can call them kids now. They're witnesses of faith to me. I thought it was a little toasty in the cassock, and I have on a brand new pair of shoes. Maybe you know that. You're never supposed to wear a brand new pair of shoes anywhere, especially on fill in the blank, rosary walk. Now, these kids are carrying these flags, are standing at attention. I have no complaints. It's always good to pray before we begin, especially when your notes look like this. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, whatever comes out, hopefully it is the Spirit. Uh, yeah. So as I was leading the rosary walk, Doug was walking next to me. I said, you got to be my wingman because I get, I panic when I'm in front of people. I'm really a shy person and, and it's very uncomfortable for me. And so I know I, I choked praying the Hail Mary and the Rosary when I've had to do it in front of people before. So at least a couple times I said, Doug, was that 10? <laughs> I wrote down, you can't see it, I wrote, I wrote down on this side the mysteries, because in the middle of it, then I'm, I'm thinking ahead which mystery's coming up next, and then I mess up the Hail Mary. That's what happens. But glory be to God, he's given us a grace to be here today. Maybe for me to say a few things that are meaningful. I was, uh, as I was leaving the rosary, every now and then I'd turn back to make sure we weren't leaving everybody behind. And, and I didn't know what statue those boys were carrying. And when I looked back during the fourth decade, I thought what I saw was them carrying Jesus, carrying his cross. And there are a few of those Hail Marys I hardly could get through. As I pondered what it was like for Jesus to carry that cross amidst a jeering crowd. We passed the building, you might have heard it, those guys were saying really bad language. I'm thinking there are kids present. I don't care what you disrespect me, but there's kids present, watch your mouth. What kind of incivility have we come to in this country? I thought Jesus was carrying his cross. And then what it reminded me is such marches as these. As you're saying, tons of marches, but none for faith. And every night, you know, on Corpus Christi, we would go out with the Blessed Sacrament in the monasteries. And I remember how, uh, what's it, uh, out of place it seemed. The sacred amidst the profane. But didn't always used to be that way. People used to look at Catholics and think favorably of them. We never used to be afraid to have Jesus be present and accounted for till people like Obama come along and say, oh no, you can worship what you want in those four walls, but don't even think about bringing it outside that door. How did that happen? How did we get to this point where we're here today feeling almost out of place as we walk down the city street? Maybe you were thinking as I was. People are staring at me. People are staring at us. I wonder what they're thinking. How did it get to this? How did it get to that point where we are not brave soldiers? We're only a few. That Barry gave us a little history lesson, didn't he? A glorious history lesson. I've been studying that since I was in eighth grade. And I've often said, you know, soldiers would follow General Patton, old blood and guts, to their death, knowing that at least he was leading them. And if they survived, they would do it for the loved ones back home. If they died, and if they survived, they got to go home. They would follow him because he was a man. He was a leader. But as, as an aside, he was talking about who you want in the foxhole. I tell you who I don't want in the foxhole is somebody who's confused about his gender. Yeah. 
That was the greatest generation. And what happened after that, I've explained it to others this way, that they suffered deprivation from 1929 and the orchestrated, I hope you understand this, the stock market crash of 1929 was orchestrated by the power elite just like they're orchestrating everything else today. And that stock market crashes and the people of the whole world suffered deprivation clear through for the next 10, 11 years and then what happened? Then came World War II, again an orchestrated event, and now they suffer even greater deprivation and they finally, the lucky ones, made their way back home. Their bodies weren't blown to bits on the beaches of Normandy or in Peleliu over in the Pacific. They made it back home and what did they do? They, they loved their wife and their children and they said, I'm going to give you everything that I never had. And unfortunately that attitude spoiled those kids rotten. Yep. And those baby boomers came of age in about 1968. And you know what happened then? The sexual revolution, 1973, Roe v. Wade. Yep. Where were our Catholic leaders throughout all of this? How did they let this happen? How did they yeah. not speak up? No, they're too busy over in the Vatican coming up with these crazy ideas after Vatican II. 1963 America, here's another history lesson. The Supreme Court decided you can no longer have prayer in public schools. Never mind that it was perfectly constitutional for the first 174 years of our republic. Where were the bishops then? Saying, oh no, we will have prayer in our public schools, we'll have prayer in our private schools, but those, those schools were built by your dollars. And you get these people on the Supreme Court saying, no, you can't pray in public schools. They threw God out. Who in their right mind would think that was a good idea? And then... Never have. Then they throw out the Ten Commandments. You can't have the public display of Ten Commandments. There's a phrase, out of sight, out of mind. And we let it happen. Where were our bishops speaking up? We hear a lot about these days, worrying about social justice issues. It's social injustice to have four and a half million people going across that border. That's against the Catholic Catechism of the Church. You have to respect and obey the just laws of the country. Yeah. It's a sacrilege what these bishops are doing, what Catholic charities so infiltrated by George Soros and this Arabella Corporation. It is a sacrilege what they've done. And you know full well the drugs that are coming across. You know full well the sex trafficked children that are being trafficked across that border. And where are the bishops? They said we follow General Patton to our death, if needs be. But our bishops have gone AWOL, and we saw that in spades, didn't we? Yes. 2020 comes along. Where are our bishops? Right. Let us lock the churches. You know, you think back to the Cristeros in Mexico in 1926, the Tarpacayes closed the churches at gunpoint, and he assassinated. He, Firing squad in priests and people for being Catholic. By the way, if you haven't seen that movie, For Greater Glory, yeah. get it, see it, don't delay. Sure. When you see what the, our federal government did, the Masonic people in our federal governments gave the Mexican government, the atheist Mexican government, Gatling guns to shoot Catholics in exchange for oil leases. Yeah. Thank you, Masons. You can't be a Mason and a Catholic. No, no. Bishops are confused about that too. How is it that nobody knows that? So many people don't know that out there. Well, there's they're shutting the churches at gunpoint in 1926, and Catholics stood up then and they said, no, we're going to church and we're fighting for our church. They closed our churches without firing a single shot. And the bishops left them. They went a wall. I was, I was joking with Judge, um, Doug over there. In, in war, if a soldier goes AWOL, he puts the entire company, the entire battalion, he puts everybody at risk. So to make sure that you understood by going AWOL, it's not a good idea, sometimes they would have a, a court trial, what's it called, court martial, and, and, and shoot them for going AWOL. 
because they were endangering everybody else. What should we do to our bishops? Yeah. Do not say, I said to shoot them. <laughs> God's going to take care of them in due course. Yes. But understand the significance of them going AWOL. Yes. When you can have a thousand people in Walmart at a time, when the Planned Parenthood baby murdering factories are open, when the liquor stores are open, and these bishops closed our churches and they went, they went AWOL. So it's out in um, some place in Idaho. Doug, I've been to, where is he? I've been to Idaho. A couple times now. Very good Catholics up there in Idaho. They've all escaped from Washington State and from California. They moved up to Idaho. Where there's still a little bit of freedom and less crazy. But I was there not for Catholics. I was there because uh, Clay Clark and D General Flynn have this reawaken America, and they're going place to place with these massive crowds. There were 7,000 Protestants out there. And, and one Catholic priest. So yeah, I knew that they wanted me to be there, but I, you know, you still feel a little uncomfortable walking in front of 7,000 not Catholics. And I, and I mentioned that kind of it's a famous line now. You can't be Catholic and be a Democrat. And I said, and furthermore, you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat. The place went bananas. 7,000 people. Protestants can seem to get together 7,000 people in a lonely little place up in Idaho. That's because they have leaders. Leaders that will lead them. Where are bishops? What's this guy's name here? This, What's his name? Tilka. 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 Memo to Bishop Tilka. How dare you lock your churches so we cannot go in and pray the rosary? Tilka, I want your miter on a platter, and we won't stop until we get it, you filthy fraud of a bishop. They get away with murder. They're murdering your souls. I don't say that lightly. They have put your souls at risk because they have told you the holy sacrifice of the Mass is not important. What is that moron of a cardinal? You know, I used to I used to have this, this, it was like a routine in the classes I taught in school. And I called it the daily moron. Because, oh, no. no, listen, some people got offended. So listen, if you go rob a bank, what are you? A bank robber. If you do bad things to children, what are you? A child molester. If you act like a moron, what are you? A moron. So the kids got it. They look forward to it. Father, who's the daily moron? And one look at the news, and you, you, can, you can pick from a dozen two different choices. Um... We have a moron of a cardinal up in Chicago who dared to tell a priest, all his priests, you shall not baptize a baby during COVID. We want your mitre, Blaze Supich. He has committed sacrilege by allowing Holy Communion, the body, blood, soul, and identity of Jesus Christ our Lord. To be distributed to, well, when, when Cardinal George died, Rahm Emanuel, the Jewish mayor, waltzed up. Everybody knows it. What does that message send you as priest? Well, Cardinal Sue's letter, a Jewish mayor receive Holy Communion. Listen, if you're Catholic and you're not in a state of grace, you don't receive. You're not entitled to receive. The Jewish mayor who does not believe cannot say amen. He doesn't get Holy Communion, Blaise Subic, and neither does Lori Lightfoot. Lori Lightfoot. Lori Lightfoot. Lori Lightfoot. Oh. A lesbian Methodist. She's not even Catholic. She's not in communion with the church. She doesn't get communion, Blaise Subic. Turn in your mitre. Yes. Where are our leaders that gone AWOL? Which one of them would you follow to your death? Vigano. Vigano. <laughs> he's, he's not American, but we follow him. Bishop Snyder, he's not American either. Father Altman. Oh, no. 
So I, I tell, I say this, and I'll say it again. I mean, I'm the greatest sinner in this entire group of people. And a woman wrote to me from Scotland and said, Father, you shouldn't say that. And the, JB2 went to confession at least once a week, if not daily. The great Father John Harden went to confession daily. The closer that you get to the cross, the more you realize how unworthy you are. Amen. He, he came anyway. Because his love is that great. And the closer you get to that love, you cannot help but fall on your knees like St. Peter and say, away from me, Lord. And I'm sin. Well, so who shall we follow? Uh, Bishop Strickland. He is the one good one here in America. There's a lot of work, but he's not really here. He was his... Look what look what Godoglio has done to him. Yeah. And every good and holy bishop of the few that there were. He's canceling them like they canceled the priests. Priests are afraid to speak up because they're afraid of being canceled. I guess see I've said this before. The stupidest thing William Patrick Callahan could have done to me was to cancel me. Because I got nothing left to lose. So. He regrets that decision now, I'm sure. Before I could only go four weekends a year. Now look at here I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and let him just try. Let him just try to excommunicate me. You didn't excommunicate baby murderers, Blaze Supich. Yeah. William Patrick Callahan. You didn't excommunicate baby murderers. And you didn't lay aside child molesters. So don't talk to me about laicization and excommunication, Blaise Sewage or Bishop Callahan. I'm waiting for you. Bring it right here on the stage. I got a few things to say. To you. So you say, well, they've taken away your faculties. I'm a priest to the forever yep. in the line of kids and dad. They will never take away my faculty to hear your confession, to baptize your babies and to deliver unto you the Holy Eucharist. God ordained me, and I must obey God rather than men. Yeah. Since 1963, our bishops and even before have been AWOL. They were AWOL at Vatican II. They were AWOL after Vatican II, and when in Blaise Supich's diocese, you can have somebody up in front of the sanctuary blowing soap bubbles. Look, and they were big ones. You've probably seen the sacrilege. Yeah. And you saw the sacrilege in Blaise Supich's diocese where that priest makes the sign of the cross with his guitar. Oh, rock with us, Jesus, as we roll with you. He's lucky I wasn't there. I'm going to wrap that guitar around his neck. Blaise Supich, you viper, you false, fraudulent bishop of a Catholic church. How dare you, Blaze Supers. Tell your priest not to baptize the babies. Well, where are the bishops? They've gone AWOL. So what are we going to do? We do have a good bishop. Right here in Peoria. The great Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Isn't he here somewhere? And what did he tell us? He said, do not rely on the bishops. He said that 70 years ago. Don't rely on the bishops. Here's, let me just share this with you in case I've met, you haven't heard me say it before. In Jesus' day, there was the equivalency of the bishops. They were called the Sanhedrin. They were 70 in number. They had been 70 since the days of Moses and the Exodus. And of that 70 that were there in Jesus' day, we know of two who were decent. There was Nicodemus who came sneaking around in the middle of the night. I think that's John chapter 3. right? Because if, if the other guys caught him, he was going to get thrown out of the temple. So I, there's, so we have Nicodemus. It's to him that Jesus said, Unless you are baptized in water and the Spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Get a grip, Blaise Sewage. Go read John chapter 3. <laughs> Dare you tell him a priest he cannot baptize a baby. And then we know there was Gamaliel, right? In Acts chapter 5 where Peter and John are rearrested and 
And they bring him in and they say, you're trying to bring that man's blood upon our heads. And I'm thinking if the shoe fits. Because yeah, remember, at, before Pilate, they said, let his blood be on our heads and on our children. And they got their wish in the year 70. And what did Peter say? We must obey God rather than men. So we know too, Gamaliel and Nicodemus, that meant 68 out of 70 were losers. They crucified Jesus either directly by inciting the crowds to scream out, crucify Jesus, or um, or through their silence, which is complicity. Yes. Yes. Silence is complicity. Yes. 68 out of 70, that's 96%. Of the religious hierarchy in Jesus' day, who saw him work miracles with their very eyes, who saw him raise the dead. They knew they raised he raised Lazarus from the dead because they're trying to kill off Lazarus to get rid of the evidence. It's in the Gospels. They, they still crucified Jesus. Why do we think the percentage of our shepherds today are any are, are not the same percentage of losers? Right, right, right. What are we living in deluded land? What more evidence do you need than $5 billion worth of payouts for covering up boy rapists? What more evidence do we need than that? What more evidence do we need to know that they locked us out of our churches, just like Bishop Tilka did here? Yes. What more evidence do we need, Bishop Tilka? Turn in your crozier, Bishop Tilka. You're not worthy of it. Yes. Our, our leaders have gone AWOL, so we can't rely upon them. That's what Fulton Sheen said so many years ago. What we can do is we can rely upon each other. And as I said last night, we had a small gathering. You know, what you do is you cast yourselves in the arms of God. This is St. Philip Neri. You cast yourselves in the arms of God and rest assured if he wants anything of you, he'll fit you for the task and give you the strength. So, so many people come up to say, what can I do, Father? There's nothing I can do. Nothing matters. Well, first of all, you prepare for battle. Doug Berry's all about that. Right. Listen to him. Isn't that great program of his all about preparation? Prepare for battle, which means every single day you must train, which means you must spend an hour a day training. If you're not doing that, what happens when you get thrown into the thick of the battle? You get killed. You let down your fellow soldiers. You let down your teammates. We're supposed to be on the same team, the Catholic team. So do your practice. Practice and train. So that you can, when that day comes, that Almighty God looks down the bench and he says, I need to put you in the game. You're ready. And that will happen for each one of us. Because in every day, in every way, he can use us if we're open to him and say to him what Samuel said, speak, Lord, I'm listening. And it was David said, here I am, Lord, I've come to do your will. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's what Archbishop Fulton Jishin told us to do. So that's what we can do. If you're doing it right here today in your witness of faith to me, inspires me to keep going along no matter what those bishops have to say. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Um, let's see. I guess I think I've covered all the, the main points on here. Uh, I think so. And, and I think I was only supposed to talk for 15 minutes and I never keep track, so I apologize if I kept you in the hot too long. But let us pray. Nomini Pontus, if you the Spirit of Santa, amen. Heavenly Father, again, send your Spirit down upon us. Let us remember what you want us to remember. Let us be inspired to go forth and be Christian soldiers like we're called to be. Let us follow the true leaders of the church, few though they are. And be a witness of faith to you unto martyr and red or white. And we ask this grace in Nomini Pontus, if you the Spirit of Santa, amen. God bless you all.